Good day, learners of the Western Cape. On the 1st of December, you will be writing your Grade 12 NSE exams. And today, we will look at what to expect in the Consumer Studies exam paper. The paper is a three-hour paper that is made up of 200 marks. There are six questions that are all compulsory. The format is shown on the table below. And it's very important to look at the time allocation. Section A will be the short questions. And this should not be mistaken as the easy part of the question paper. All topics and subtopics in Grade 12 Recovery ATP may be assessed in this section. Never leave a question unattempted, so guess if you must. Never leave blank open spaces. Be 100% sure before changing your initial um, answer, as your first instinct is usually the correct one. Provide only one answer per line, as you can see in the bottom one. Do not do this. Do not write C slash B, as only the first answer will be marked. There we go. And then another tip is to always do the questions below each other and do not leave lines open in between your answers. This will really help the markers. Now we're going to look at different types of questions that can be expected in Section A. First, we're going to look at multiple choice. It's very important that you start off by reading through all the possible answers. Then cancel out the ones that are totally incorrect. Then read the other remaining answers again. And then decide which one is most correct. In this case, we can see that the similarity between the number of people wearing haute couture an obsolete fashion is that B, few people are seen wearing the fashion. Other types of questions in section one will be to choose the correct word from the option given in brackets or from a list. It's very important that you just write your question number 1.2.1 and then write the correct term next to that. In this case, capital gains tax, excise duty, etc. Another type of question that you can expect in question one will be to match column A with column B. And you only write it as 1.4.1C. Do not write up, um, out the whole terminology or the whole word or the whole sentence. Only write the symbol next to your question number. Another one that can be expected is to write the correct term for the description. So yeah, it's very important that you know your definitions in, on, in order to answer this question. Right, section B will be your longer questions, and this will consist of question two, which is the consumer, question three, food and nutrition, question four, clothing, question five, housing, question six will be entrepreneurship. All of this will require short or longer answers. There will be source-based questions that will be based on tables, pictures, case studies, and cartoons which I will address later in the PowerPoint. And then all questions will have different levels of questioning that will range from remembering, understanding, application, and problem solving. We are now going to look at some general tips when it comes to the longer questions, which is section B. Start each question on a new page. What goes with that is to rule off at the end of each question to help the marker to calculate your marks. 
Leave line, lines open in between each of the sub-questions. And do not squeeze the last sub-question in at the bottom of the page, as that often prevents you from completing your answer, as you have the whole answer book at your disposal. All questions always starts from easy to the more challenging or more difficult ones. If you're finished before the time, reread your answers and use this time available to compare the mark allocation of the questions to your answers to make sure that you have written enough. Number the questions according to the numbering system used in the exam paper. We are now going to look at how to answer specific questions. When you get a question like the following, write a paragraph to explain the effects of high glycemic index, which is high GI foods, and low glycemic index, which is the low GI foods, on blood glucose levels. What helps you is to circle all the actions or the verbs in each question, and this gives you the instruction and indicates what is expected in the response. In this case, it will be to write a paragraph and explain. Then what is helpful is to underline or highlight what the question is about. Always important to remember to look at the mark allocation as that will tell you how much you must write. And then you can take note of special things. Uh, example, do they ask for more than one thing in one answer? And here you can clearly see that they want the effect of high glycemic index as well as low glycemic index. Another example will be to write a paragraph. If a question says write a paragraph, you must formulate your answer in paragraph format. One mark will be deducted if your answer is not in a paragraph format. Now we're going to look at how to write a paragraph. It's important to write full sentences. No bullets must be given. Then also start and end the paragraph by referring to the statement or the question asked. If a scenario is given, do not use the exact wording from the scenario, but always try to put it in your own words. Another example. When a question asks you to tabulate your answer, it must be presented in a table format. As you can see in this example here, it says copy the table below into your answer book and compare non-provincial tax and provincial tax. And remember to circle the verb, which is copy the table. One mark will be deducted if your answer is not in table format. And at this stage, we do not want to lose any more marks. Another example will be where a specific number of facts are required, for example, list three, only the first three facts will be marked. On the right hand side, I've given you an example. It says name four ways in which the employees can express their individuality when they wear corporate clothing. So here the learner has written hairstyles, they got a mark for that, accessories, which will be a second mark, makeup, which will be a fourth mark. Corporate clothing is unfortunately wrong, but because this is the first four facts given, the marker will slash it off and will not mark style of shoes, which is correct, but that is unfortunately the fifth factor. And there you can see only the first four answers will be marked, even though the fifth one is correct. Another example, if you get a scenario or a comic or a table or a graph, all the questions will be based on that. No unnecessary information will ever be given to you. So it's very important that you use all the information in the case study to answer your questions. And here you can see that if you look at 2.3, they've given you a case study that says read the extracts below and answer the questions that follow. And here you can see all the 2.3.1, 2.3.2 and 2.3.3 will be on 2.3's scenario.
And the last one we will be looking at is the marker location. The marker location will inform you how much to write and also how to answer the question. Let's look at a few different examples. Firstly, they ask you to explain how the increase in the petrol and diesel price will contribute to the challenges that Africans have to put food on the table. And here you can see the marker location of three marks. How will you get your three marks? You can list three facts below each other. Where the next one has the same verb, here you have to explain as well, explain the purpose of stock control in a business. But if you look at the mark allocation, it says three times two is equal to the six marks. How will you get your marks in this case? Here you have to list three different facts and give an explanation about each fact in order to get your marks. And lastly, the verb here tells you to evaluate. Evaluate the suitability of the fish cakes in the management of coronary heart diseases. This is a nice long question of 10 marks. And how will you get your 10 marks? Here you can list nine facts, but at the end you have to come to a conclusion. We've tried to condense some of the notes and we're going to focus on a couple of areas that we think would help you in your final preparation start with the food nutrition question I would like to look at the contents first first of all this is going to be question three in your paper and it's going to be 40 marks it is important to understand that some of the content has been taken out for 2022 and therefore I would urge you again to use your exam guidelines in conjunction with your studying to make double sure that you do not study extra work. If we look at our first section on the food nutrition, it is our food related health conditions. And these are the topics that I'm going to have a look at today with you. Coronary heart disease, high blood cholesterol, high blood pressure and anemia. Please make sure that if you are working from old past papers or working through old past papers, and you find questions on osteoporosis or diabetes or anorexia or any of the other health conditions that you don't confuse yourself in thinking that you need to study them. This is the only four food related health conditions that we're going to look for for 2022. Then we are also looking at the foodborne diseases. Again, there has been um, there has some of them has been taken out of the curriculum for this year so you only need to know hepatitis a tuberculosis e coli and gastroenteritis a lot of students think that oh this is this is all the info for for food and food is quite a big section of of your paper so please don't forget and yet i'm not going to look at that today with you but don't forget about food additives labeling and your food related consumer issues genetically modified organically grown irradiated and a very important one which i think can be focused on is food security so this just in short is the contents of question three again please use your exam guidelines in conjunction with this to make sure that you don't um, study a waste time basically on any of the work that you don't need to know. So let's have a look today and now at coronary heart disease. First of all, you need to know the descriptions. You need to know what are the causes and you need to know how we're going to prevent it and how we're going to manage it. And often these are very close to one another. So I told my students to go back to your grade 10 textbook and go and read up again on the 11 dietary guidelines. You'll remember that we did that in grade 10. And there is a, as a vast majority of um, nice, interesting tips that you can use. If you are stuck and you're like, oh, I can't, I can't think of anything, then you can always fall back on a dietary guideline. And nine out of 10 times, it will be something correct. So you'll notice a lot of the dietary guidelines in some of these notes today. So let's have a look and see what is coronary heart disease. First of all, it is a disease of the blood vessels, the arteries. 
Um, now these arteries, they are the vessels that supply, um, or blood is in them, and that um, supply the heart muscles of blood and oxygen. So when there is a disease of these vessels or arteries, then you will develop coronary heart disease. Okay, what can be the causes of it? First of all, it develops very slowly. We often don't see these kind of diseases in young adults. Uh, we find them in people much older because it takes a, a while for you uh, of living a, a bad uh, or unhealthy lifestyle for all of this fat to build up in your arteries. And that's exactly what it is. We're going to talk about a certain type of fat called cholesterol. And cholesterol is a fatty substance that forms a plaque within your arteries. Now, what this plaque does is it narrows the arteries, it thickens it, and it hardens it as well. And we call that astrocleurosis. Okay. Now, this de um, decreases the space through which the blood can actually flow. And I'll show you a picture in a minute. And when there's a blockage of the arteries to the heart, we normally get a heart attack from it. And if there's a blockage of the arteries to the brain, we normally know it or know it as a stroke. And here I've given you an example of, um, of an artery, a healthy artery or normal artery at the top. And you can see there's no restriction. The blood can flow very easily through it. And at the bottom, you will see all of that build up, that yellow plaque that is sitting there. It's almost like plaque that you get on your on your teeth. Um, and I always explain to my students, I said to them, you know, it's when you, it's like when you, you're, you're frying sausage in a, in a pan and you come back a little bit later and you see all of that fat is sort of uh, solidified inside your pan. And, and when you pick it up, it, it almost feels like Vaseline. It's this fatty, white substance. And then when you take that fat and you throw it all down your sink in your kitchen, your mum has a slight little heart attack because you know that all of that fat goes and sits at the bottom of your of your um, sink in your drain. And eventually that will block your drain. And it's exactly what's happening here. Having a diet very high in, in, in saturated fats will eventually build up all of this plaque inside of, uh, um, inside of your arteries. Uh, a good thing that we know about this, and, and we'll talk about it a little bit later, is that you can actually get rid of this bad fat. You can get rid of this cholesterol in your body by eating healthy fats. And, and I'll, I'll show you that in, in a minute. When we move on, we're now going to look at something called high blood cholesterol. Now, high blood cholesterol, as I said to you early on, cholesterol is this white, waxy, fatty substance that occurs inside your blood. And I often think that it feels like that fatty, vaseline type of fat that you get in the bottom of your pan when you, when you fry your food. Now, what can cause this? Too much saturated fat. And I don't know if you can remember what saturated fats are, but they are normally our fats that our body struggles to get rid of. And they normally come from animals. Um, it can be hereditary, which means you can actually inherit high blood cholesterol from your family. You can get it um, because of an underactive thyroid. Um, you can get it because of chronic kidney failure or even alcohol abuse. Now, how do we prevent it? And, and uh, I want to stress here to show you that sometimes in our questions, they will ask us diet-related preventions, or sometimes they will ask us lifestyle changes. So make double sure that if they are talking about lifestyle changes, that it's things such as exercise, smoke, stress, those are examples. And that's got to do with how you live your lifestyle. Food-related um, preventions are all to do with, you know, eat healthy, eat a balanced diet, reduce your fat intake, that kind of thing. Okay, so double check the question very carefully and make sure that you know if they're asking dietary related or lifestyle related. Then you can also prevent high blood cholesterol with medication and you can prevent it by losing weight. You'll see in these two next slides that I'm going to show you about the management of it, that it is very similar to the 11 dietary guidelines. And that's why I said, if you do yourself a favor, 
go and study the guidelines again, the 11 guidelines, the dietary guidelines, and then you've got a good amount of info that you can use for in case you get stuck and you can't remember what to write. Um, so first thing that we're going to do here is to lower the intake of our saturated and our trans fats. So all the fats that come from animal sources like here, cream, cheese, butter, animal fat, the fat in your cakes and chocolates and chips and sweets and those kind of things, coconut oil, people are so in love with coconut oil nowadays, but it is very high in saturated fats. Ne? Eat monosaturated fats rather, olive oil, avocado, peanuts, nuts, um, they also say to restrict things like organ meats, shrimp and calamari. Often you'll go for seafood and you're thinking, oh, seafood, it's healthy. But seafood in, in large amounts can also um, not be good for us. Then restrict your intake of red meat. Red meat, especially that, that fat that sits on your choppy or the fat that's hidden inside of your mincemeat or your sausage, um, make sure that you cut it off or that you discard of it and, and rather change your red meat to eating white meats, chicken and um, turkey, fish. Remember fish is the only animal source or the only fat anim the only fat that comes from animal that is good for us. okay um, And therefore they love to ask sardines and poultrys and salmon. Because these are fatty fish. And yes, we want to take the fat in our diet because it's good for us. But we want to use the correct fat. So make sure that you know examples of this. Increase your intake of legumes. Now, those of you that can't remember what legumes are, they are, they are nuts and seeds and um, our um, lentils and peas and those kind of things. Okay, Increase your intake. Or, or sorry, eat a balanced diet, eat fiber rich foods such as whole grain. So remember that fiber, it fills you up. It also takes away some of that bad cholesterol and picks it up and it moves it through your system. And eat soluble fiber like oats and apples. On the second slide, you will see it is basically the dietary guidelines. Eat five portions of fruit and vegetables a day. Use salt sparingly. Consume alcohol in moderation. Remove the skin from your poultry before you cook it. That nice crispy skin on your KFC that you so love to eat, that's where all the fat lies. Eat lean meats, so low cuts, um, things like ostrich meat, for example, is very low in fat. Or if you eat a fillet steak um, instead of, let's say, a sirloin, um, and you can cut that, if you can see visible fat, then you should actually cut that off rather. Um, eat less processed meat. Uh, those of you that can't remember what processed meat are, those are all your salamis and your polonis and your sausages and your things that has been man-made. Um, we often don't know what meat is in them, but often a lot of fat also gets added to it to enhance the flavor of it. And we eat these hidden fats without knowing it. Replace your butter with soft margarine. Remember, butter comes from an animal. And margarine comes from a plant, so you can do a switch in those two. You can replace full cream milk with low fat or fat free milk. Use oil rather, um, rather than butter. And then you can also change your cooking method. Instead of frying all your food all the time, use your dry and your moist cooking methods like grill and bake and boil and steam and poach. And I mean, the air fryer, I think for a lot of us, those of you that have an air fryer, um, has really changed the way that we cook. I can't even remember when last I have put oil in a pan to, to fry some chips or anything like that. Everything goes in my air fryer. Um, so these are nice tips on how to manage high blood cholesterol levels in your diet. Now, cholesterol can also be broken up into two different types of cholesterol. We get a bad cholesterol and a good one. So the bad one is called your low density lipoproteins and your good ones is your high density lipoproteins. Now the low um, density lipoproteins comes from saturated fats. Uh, all our animal fats and the fats that are not good for us and the high density lipoproteins 
good ones come from monounsaturated fats. Now, these fats, interesting enough, when you eat a diet high in HDL um, um, uh, fats, lipoproteins, they can actually counteract the bad ones. They can get rid of the bad ones. So that's a, it's a good, you can kind of fight um, bad fat with good fat, which I always think is quite, quite cool. Um, right, so the next one is high blood pressure. So some of you might have um, felt a bit of blood pressure before. You might get up and you feel, oh, your head goes, it makes this funny sound in your head. So we often also, or another word for, for high blood pressure is called hypertension. So hypertension is the pressure of the blood against the artery walls. And high blood pressure develops when the walls of the larger arteries loses their natural elasticity. And they become rigid and the smaller arteries becomes narrower. And you can imagine that artery goes smaller and smaller. The blood that has to flow through it has to be pushed harder to go through. And basically it is the pressure of that blood against the artery walls. And often that is what makes us feel so bad when we've got high blood pressure. What can cause this? An excessive amount of salt intake. And be careful for hidden salts. Salts in chips and salts in... Um, processed foods and soups and sauces and salad dressings and those kind of things. Salt is, is important because it gives flavor to our food, but too much salt can have a really bad impact on our diet. And we're going to look at tips on how what else can you use instead of salt a little bit later. It can also be caused by smoking, being overweight, a lack of physical activity, Insufficient intake of milk products, excessive alcohol consumption, stress, which is a serious one and quite a difficult one for a lot of us to deal with nowadays. Stress at work, stress at home, financial stress, family stress. I mean, there are, there's quite a lot of that. Your age, medication can cause high blood pressure, family history. And then you can also have thyroid problems, which can add to these high blood pressure um, session or cause, cause high blood pressure. How can we prevent it? Healthy, balanced diet. Maintain a healthy weight. Be physically active. Okay, That meaning do your exercises 30 minutes roughly per day. Restrict your alcohol intake. Do not smoke prevent or control diabetes. And here you can see again, a lot of it looks like the dietary guidelines. So once you know the dietary guidelines and you're stuck and you can't come up with something, use something from those 11. And I promise you, somewhere in there, you will have the correct one. What I've done here is I've just broken it up for you slightly into the lifestyle changes, the diet and the medication. Those are the three ways that we can manage it. So Lifestyle changes, because it might be that you eat really, really well and you eat all the right foods, but you don't do much. So lifestyle's got to do with exercise. 30 minutes, moderate exercise every day. Manage your stress. Okay, stop smoking. Diet related, use less salt. So if, if I say to someone, you can't use so much salt, what alternative, what, what can I tell that person to use instead of salt? Use herbs, use spices, that you can also flavor your food nicely with. Avoid processed foods because they contain a lot of hidden fats and salts. Lose some weight. Eat more calcium, potassium and magnesium because they lower our blood cholesterol pressure or our blood pressure, sorry. Restrict your alcohol intake. Again, here comes the dietary guidelines and reduce your intake of coffee and tea. And then a third way that you can manage it is by taking in medication. And that's normally the last resort. No one wants to be on chronic medication for high blood pressure. You would like to prevent it before you have to get to this. And prevention and, and, and management goes hand in hand. And you'll often see that, the, that the, uh, in the textbook as well that it overlap quite a lot. Getting to our final one, and this is anemia. And an anemia, I think, is, a, is an important one for us because a lot of our young 
girls suffer from anemia. Um, not that boys can't get it, but it, girls and, and women are at higher risk, and that's normally due to the fact that they lose some blood during menstruation. So let's have a look what is anemia. In your, in your blood, there's red blood cells, and these red blood cells contain hemoglobin. Now hemoglobin, this carries the oxygen through to the cells in your body. Now when you have anemia, it's a condition when, where there's not enough of this hemoglobin in your blood cells, and therefore there's enough, not enough oxygen. And if there's not enough oxygen, you will often feel very tired, you're weak, you're lethargic, you're short of breath, and, and we often see that, that people that are anemic are also very, very pale. Here we see that women are at higher risk uh, because they lose blood during menstruation. Another group that is also at risk here is often uh, our vegetarians because a lot of our products that contain iron, which we need to for the red blood cells and hemoglobin, comes from animal sources like liver. And, and if you are um, a vegetarian, you're not going to eat it. So often we see that vegetarians can be anemic if they don't take in extra iron supplements or alternatives. So what causes anemia? Insufficient iron intake, too little iron during um, pregnancy. So often when you're pregnant, um, there's obviously now a lot more blood in your body uh, or the body produces a lot more and often you will feel quite tired during your pregnancy and it is because of that iron deficiency. We get it in toddlers. Toddlers grow incredibly fast or quickly, and therefore sometimes they don't get enough iron through their diet and what they are eating. Not enough iron due, um, due to heavy bleeding while you're menstruating. And that's why we sometimes don't feel nice when we are menstruating as well. You feel weak, you feel tired, you feel like that lack of, lack of energy, um, and it's because you are losing blood, and with that you're losing oxygen. Okay. Um, it can also be due to a bleeding ulcer or blood loss after um, a huge in in this, uh, injury, sorry, if you were in a car accident or something like that. Um, it can be because of a weak absorption of iron due to medication, and it can also be because of chronic kidney diseases. So there's quite a lot of things that can bring on anemia. Now, there are four um, a very important nutrients that we need to take in to uh, manage our anemia. First of all is our iron. Now we spoke about iron before so, and here you can see all our most of our animal sources are high in iron. Liver, red meat, fish, chicken, whole grain cereals, legumes, green leafy vegetables, eggs, dried fruit and um, well, I've, I've put it like this for you guys. I've got some of the info out of the grade 11 textbook as well. Um, it is important that you have a good understanding of what nutrients can be found in some of these foods and that you've got a good knowledge of food so that when we ask a question in the exam, let's say I give you a menu, you will be able to identify out of that menu, oh, okay, she had liver for breakfast. So I know that liver is put into that question for a specific reason. But if you don't know that liver contains iron, that's when it becomes difficult and you can't analyze the question properly. So please go and study this really, really well. Vitamin B12. So here's again our meat, chicken, fish, eggs, green leafy vegetables, dairy products. Folic acid is, a, is an interesting one. And we often have to take in folic acid while we are pregnant or before we fall pregnant as well. Remember, it helps with spina bifida. We did that in grade 11. But nevertheless, it's also in liver, green leafy vegetables, and whole grain cereals. And I always say to my students, study spinach and broccoli. Spinach and broccoli is amazing. It fits in everywhere. Everywhere where you see these green leafy vegetables, it's spinach and broccoli. Vitamin C, and I remember from the grade 11 textbook, it says that guavas are the best source of vitamin C. We often think, oh, it's oranges or tangerines or papayas or citrus fruits, but it's not. It's actually guava. 
berries, broccoli. We don't often think of vegetables having um, vitamin C in them. Brussels sprouts, cabbage, cauliflower, citrus fruit. Here comes all our oranges and tangerines. Green peppers, tomatoes, kiwi fruits, papaya. These are all good examples and they are often used in the exams. Um, so have a good background knowledge of your your um, your foods that contain these nutrients. How can I prevent it? And and often when students study anemia, they just study. Oh, I need to not take. I need to take in more iron, vitamin B12, folic acid, and vitamin C. But they don't know what it is. They don't know examples of it. That's why here on the right hand side, I have given you. Uh, uh, some examples of food options. So go and study a couple so that you can identify them in the test. Do not drink coffee and tea together with your meals because it lowers 50% of your iron absorption. We often see that people will have dinner and they'll have a cup of coffee with it or a cup of tea and, and um, now we know that that's not good to drink that in conjunction with your food because your body will not absorb the iron it's supposed to. Right, so guys, this is the only food-related um, illnesses that you need to know. The next, not the food-related, this is the food-related illnesses, which is the hepatitis A, tuberculosis, E. coli, and gastroenteritis. I told my students the easiest way here Normally, they give you a scenario, and in the scenario, there will be some hints as to what illness it is. Go and have a look at the incubation time. Know your incubation times really well, especially E. coli and gastro, because they are very close to each other. The, the symptoms are also very similar. And you can see there's no symptoms on here. You only need to know the transmission and the incubation time. Go and have a look in your uh, exam guidelines. It tells you exactly so you don't have to waste time by studying all the other info. Um, but let's say, for example, they'll give you a question where they say students went away on a weekend and they got sick. Um, they went away on the Friday, they only got sick on the Monday, then you know, oh, hang on a minute, or they got six, seven days later, then you can easily distinguish between is it E. coli or is it gastroenteritis. TB, I think, is, a, is an important one here as well, um, especially now because we went through COVID. So it's a question that can easily link in with COVID um, because we're talking here about coughing and sneezing and spitting and um, basically when your um, spit falls onto someone else, um, with masks, and I think they can be nice questions out of um, out of TB. So those are the ones that I would personally um, concentrate on. But you don't need to know them in that much detail. You just need to know how they get transmitted and their incubation time. To start the session, I would like to stand still with the following, and just to show you again what this question will look like in the exam. So the housing question is question five on your paper and it is 20 marks. It is quite a lot of information to study for, for a few marks, but remember that some of this can also be asked in your short questions. So what do we need to know? First, we're gonna look at rent, build and buy. And I'm not gonna look in detail to this today, but I am going to stand still with the full title and the sectional title and the difference between the two. But you need to know the advantages and the disadvantages of your different group, financial responsibilities of the three options, contractual responsibilities, and housing options. And unfortunately, this in itself is already quite a lot of work, but please don't forget about our household appliances the washing machine, the fridge, the freezer, the stove, and the microwave oven. Make sure that you only study them and that you don't focus on the ones that are not going to be asked in 2022, such as the dishwasher and the tumble dryer and so on. We're going to look at the factors to consider when buying home appliances. We are looking at the choice of household appliances, the financial responsibilities, the rights and the responsibilities of the consumer and the right. So let's start 
And as I said, this is a very short session because we are just going to look at the ownership of houses. So whenever you buy a house, whether you um, are buying a house or a flat, it doesn't matter. We are talking here about how you own the house. And you can own it either through a full title ownership or a sectional title. And the key is in the word. Full title, meaning you are the full owner of the entire property, um, the grounds and everything around it, and you're responsible for everything. Okay, You live on your own. It's a loose standing house. Sectional title means you own a section of the property. The house is yours. You are the legal owner, but you share other communal areas with people that live in the same complex or in the same um, flat or wherever we are looking. So this is the key difference. And what I've done is I've put down the advantages and the disadvantages of the two. And I just want to show you some very close similarities. And often students get themselves muddled up. And that's why we're just focusing on them today, just to reintegrate the difference between the two. Um, yet they are very similar, but yet there are quite a few things that are, are different. First of all, in both of them, you'll see the advantages that you are the legal owner. Whether you are a sectional title owner or whether you are the full title owner, you are still the legal owner of the property. You've bought the property. This has got nothing to do with rent. Okay, you cannot be a full title um, a person that rents or sectional title rent. You only get this title when you buy. So this is only applicable to buying of a property. In both of them, you can make changes to a certain degree. If you are a full title owner, you can make changes to your house, but if it's huge structural changes, you're going to have to get permission from the municipality. Okay? In the sectional title, you need to get permission from your body corporate. Inside your house, you could decide, oh, I want to paint my bedroom pink. That's fine. But you cannot do that on the outside of the property. Okay, That's why normally in a sectional title, everything on the outside looks similar. So there will be very strict rules as to what you can and cannot do. And you have to get permission beforehand. Um, in both of them, advantage, it will create a feeling of security and independence. Because once you own something, you bought it, you can use it at the bank as a, um, as a security, and you can borrow money against it again. And for both of them, it is a safe investment, because after a little while, your property will increase in value, and you can sell it again and make money on it. So you can see that the advantages of both of these are very similar. There's a few more on the sectional. For example, the owner can use common areas. So it might be that in your, <coughs> excuse me, in your, your complex, there's a swimming pool or there's a gym or there's a washroom or there's a, a park for the kids to play in. And you can use those areas. But what's nice about the sectional title is, is you don't have to maintain it. You have people that maintain the grounds for you. But when you live in a full title ownership house, you then have to do all of it yourself or pay someone to do it. Let's look at the disadvantages quickly. For both of, both of, both, excuse me, for both of them, they are very expensive and more expensive than renting. Okay, so buying is more expensive than renting. But we know with it comes the security which we all crave for. With sectional title, not only are you going to pay the bank back, but you are also going to pay a levy. Now, those of you that can't remember what a levy is, it's an extra money that you're going to pay in a month to the body corporate, and they're going to use that money to, to help keep the grounds in, in check. Clean the pool, cut the grass, uh, fix things that are broken, electric fences, those kind of things. So the things with levy is is it can increase every year. So unfortunately, the levies will go up every year with a little bit. And in some places, depending on what you've got, uh, the levies can be quite high. But the disadvantage from a full title ownership is you are responsible for all the maintenance. 
You have to cut your grass or pay someone to cut the grass. You have to clean the pool. You have to do all of those yourself. You don't have people that look after it for you. Um, in the full title owner, you are responsible for the safety and the security of your property. Whereas in the sectional title, you often feel very um, safe because you're living close to other people and there might be extra um, security um, advantages of a place like that. Security guard, electrical um, alarm systems, CCTV cameras that you won't have at your at your normal home. Um, right, you will pay a fee to the municipality, your normal um, levies or your, your cleaning fees. And on the other hand, you need to get permission from the body corporate. Both of them, your bond repayments are quite high. Um, and people struggle nowadays to, to do these repayments. We also need to remember that you need to pay capital gains tax if you sell a property, whether you are a sectional title or a full title owner. If you make money on your property after two, three years that you've got it, you're going to have to pay tax on that money that you made. And then lastly, um, it is in both cases quite difficult to sell if you have to move really fast. It's not like renting. Renting, you can, you can give up your rent and in a month's time you can move, but um, selling a property, the process is sometimes three, four, five months, depending on the difficulty of the sale. In this part, we are going to have a look at moving from an idea to producing and marketing a product, choice of a suitable product, and then factors influencing efficient production. Just before we get into it, uh, just a bit of advice from me. You have uh, the examination guidelines, so just use that to follow. It guides you. Um, and then, of course, you have a textbook, right, that you can use for background information, for the facts and all of that. The, you either have the Oxford or the Focus, or make use of that. And then be aware of relevant issues around you that's happening things that we're experiencing in South Africa, because those are the type of case studies or background information that they'll be using, things like load shedding, petrol increase, inflation increase, etc. Right, let's get into it. So we're going to be starting with identifying a potentially profitable business opportunity. Just, um, we're going to be touching on certain things that you need to know, like what is an entrepreneur, right? So the definition, the explanation or describing being able to do it so this basically um, gives us an idea of what we need to know okay so it's somebody that recognizes a need for a product or a service in a given target market they take the risk to invest money and then they are able to transform it into a successful and profitable business venture okay so do know what an entrepreneur is you should be able to this is work that you start in grade 10 with Right, so by now it should um, you should know it. Then just some um, things that should be done before investing in the business, right? So um, you will see that this comes through quite often. The target market; these are the potential customers who will be willing to buy the product um, or pay um, the amount that you're charging, right? So these are the the group of people that the business want to target. Okay, so. These are the type of things that we need to research. The industry, the product that, that the product or the service will form a part of. And then you can see here, once again, the target market, what price will they be willing to pay, right? So that will be dependent on the um, social economic status, low income, middle income or high income, how the product will be produced. And then, of course, how it will be marketed and take it to, taken to the target market. So these are just some research that the entrepreneur should have done um, when they are um, looking at a product or service that they want to produce. Okay, so requirements of a potentially profitable business. Right, so when, you, when you're studying, please have a look at the headings. So that once you the questions are asked, you are sure of what is um, asked and what is required. 
So here we're looking at the requirements. Okay, so you will see that the requirements for business can either refer to the entrepreneur or it can refer to the business in general. So if they talk about passion, they're obviously talking about the entrepreneur here. Okay, because right, this is something that they should have in order to um, drive the business. If they're not enthusiastic about it, how are they going to make other people um, be enthusiastic about it and then some other qualities that we've done in grade 10 so just think of those like they must have be creative they must have confidence good communication skills things like that as well okay so right remember in in with consumer studies that's why we start in grade 10 and we build up right target market important to identify the specific target market that's very important because the target market these are the people that's ultimately supporting the business, right? So that's why the product or the service must cater for the needs of the target market, right? And and then when we look at the product or the service, once again, yeah, it latches onto the target market. The product must meet the needs of the target market. And then, of course, very importantly, yeah, it must be made available at the price that the target market is willing to pay or can afford. The next one, if you want your business to be profitable, is to have competitive edge or competitive advantage, right? So you need to find something that's going to set your business apart from the competition, right? You want it to fill uh, the gap. You want the product or service to fill the gap, but it must have unique features that sets it apart. And yeah, I give some examples like excellent service or better quality or ideal competition or sorry, or, or, an ideal location. Um, then price is the other one should be charged that suits the target market. Here you can see, right? What are once again we're bringing it back to the target market? What are they going to be willing to pay? But we also need to set the price um, so that it covers all expenses and allow for a profit. Then location is important as well. Um, so the product must be easily available um, or reachable for the target market. So that's why it's important to consider where will it produce, distributed and sold, right? And besides that, it should be convenient and it should be safe as well. So location, location, location in business is always important, right? And then another one here is startup capital. When the business starts out, they want to make sure that they've got sufficient capital to start and run the business until it makes enough money to cover the cost as well as making a profit. And then, of course, it's important to test the business idea, especially on the target market. Okay, those are ultimately the people that's going to be supporting the business. So you want to make sure that whatever you are offering, the product or the service, it is going to be suitable, number one, for the target market. And you want to make sure that they will be willing to pay the price that you are going to charge. Right? So these are the requirements. There's no um, other way. To get to know this information but to study okay so get to know the information right so right so next we're going to have a look at the formulation of the idea and so you will see that in business or starting a product for the entrepreneur the one thing that's important is to do thorough research and then of course to draw up a business plan so why is drawing up a business plan important Okay, because sometimes when we have an idea, and it might just be an idea, but once we put it on paper, it puts the idea down and we can think about it realistically. We can organize our thoughts logically. It will help us to highlight the strengths and the weaknesses of the business. It can also serve as a guide to evaluate your progress so you can go back to see whether you are achieving the goals that you set out. You can also use it to test the viability of your business and of course it can be used to persuade potential investors to invest in your business. If you are going for a banking loan, for example, right, you are going to need a business plan. Okay. So here are the components of a business plan that you need to have an idea of or know about. So a business plan will have the information about the business, like the name of the business, the owner's details, type of ownership, etc. Then, of course, the production plan. This is a detailed description of the product or service. Um, 
it includes things like specifications, product specifications, which we'll have a look at just now, methods for making equipment, suppliers. Then it will also in, um, include market research and mark the market plan, the five P's, how it will be combined to achieve the best possible marketing strategy, financial plan. So here it will include the details about the startup capital, where we will be getting funding from, the break-even point, and the point of profit, which we'll be talking about later. Then also it in includes the management plan. So it will give information about who will manage, how many people will be employed, and of course the responsibility. And then um, it will have the SWOT analysis. So the SWOT analysis, that acronym there, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. Right, so you will see the strengths and the weaknesses are normally um, internal um, and the opportunities and threats are external. Okay, so um, yeah, you want to be aware not just only about the strengths and also on, on, of the weaknesses of the business so, you, so that you can improve on that and then what can be a threat and what opportunities are there to take advantage of. So these are the things that you want to have in your business plan. Okay, these are the type of things. So those are the components of a business plan. Right. The next thing um, that is part of formulation of the idea is the product specification. So this is a detailed description of the product. Okay, detailed description of the product. And it includes the following appearance. And I have the example of a pizza here so that we can have a physical example to look at to make it a bit more easier to remember. Right, so um, they might have a specific size, like they'll say the, the diameter must be must be 23 centimeters in diameter um, or dimensions here. They might have the colors or the flavors, okay, raw materials, ingredients to be used, how it's going to be made, um, the information about the packaging that's going to be used, equipment and method of production, right? So this is normally a detailed description, written description of the product. And will include all of those. So these are all things that you need to to know, right? So um, once more, only only way in which we can know this information is if we study it. Let's continue. Now, please look at this heading. It says factors to consider when choosing a product. So when the entrepreneur wants to make um, a choice of the product or the service, these are the factors that they need to consider. So these are the things that you need to know as well. And so the first one here is availability of human skills. So the entrepreneur comes with their own set skill, skill set. And when there is lack, they obviously um, have to employ to fulfill what they lack of. And so we'll see sometimes that business starts out small and then they gradually grow bigger. And so they will have the need to employ people, right? So there are certain things that they need to be aware of, right? So the first thing is the availability of human skills. So when appointing people, they should also be aware of or consider labor laws. And then some things that we need to know about um, in terms of humans or um, workers, I should rather say, if that's available to the market, is that we get three types of um, workers. Right, so we refer to them as unskilled workers, semi skilled workers, or skilled workers. And so we know we need to know the differences between these three here. You will see with unskilled workers, they normally have little or no training. They normally also receive um, the lowest wages. They're regarded as cheap labor and they are used to do routine, repetitive work. And then your semi skilled workers, some they might have some training, but they are not specialized in the job. Um, and they might also be trained then to do a certain section of the work. They are obviously better paid than your unskilled workers. And then we've got the skilled workers, specialized training and skills in their chosen field. They can work independently. They can deliver good quality products. And so you will see they will earn a better wage or salary, right? So know the differences between these three types of workers, okay? Because um, they can ask it. To, in, a, in a question where you have to compare, right? Two, when employing people, there's going to be a cost to the entrepreneur. There's going to be a cost to the business. So we need to know what the costs are. And so these are 
um, the cost, the compulsory cost that's got to be paid. Okay, so obviously there's going to be a wage or salary to be paid. Remember, we differentiate between a wage or salary, so you need to know that. That's work that we've done in grade 11. Then, of course, the business or the entrepreneur will have to pay, have to make a contribution of 1% of the gross or salary or wage um, to the unemployment insurance fund. Right? Remember, we did the unemployment insurance fund in grade 11. So 1%, the Employee gives 1% and employer gives 1%. So this is the contribution that the employer will have to make. And then also a 1% of the total salary or wage bill as contribution to the sector education and training facility, the CETA there. Um, and then, of course, also pay as you earn. Okay, so to uh, must be paid over to SARS, um, South African Revenue Services. So that must be uh, deducted from the workers' pay and then paid over. Okay, so... That will be the cost of employing workers, right? So when we make use of um, workers, that will be the cost of the company. Company must also company or business must make work, um, um, be a, a aware, sorry, of the available of availability of workers, um, because it's important to employ the correct people, the right people for the right positions, and then make sure that they've got the skills and be willing to do the work for the wages or salary that's offered. Okay, number two, right, of the factors to be considered is the it's financial resources, right? So um, sometimes people start small, they start with their own money, they're willing to make loans, take a second bond in the house, whatever way, right? But it is important that they have start-up um, capital or sufficient capital to keep the business operating until it starts making a profit. Okay, so we're going to have a look at startup costs first of all. These are costs needed to start the business. So these are terms that you need to know, right? And so what will startup costs be used for? Things like registration fees, business licenses and permits, deposit, deposit payable for rent, initial stock that they're going to use, equipment, packaging, right? And then there's operating costs. So startup costs is the money that you're going to need to start. Operating costs. This is the cost that you're going to um, be required to run the business. And it includes the following things like rent payments, water and electricity, salaries and wages, loan repayments, stationery, phone bill, petrol, cleaning material, anything that's going to be required to operate the business. So you also know the difference between what startup costs and your operating costs. So when the entrepreneur um, looks at finance, they need to find a way to fund the business. So the availability of finance, um, it's either they're going to be making use of their own money, they'll take out a business loan, they might um, have partners that's going to invest in the business, or they might approach investors. Okay, so those are ways in which um, they find finances. So availability of finance there, then availability of workspace, Okay, so sometimes when business starts small, they operate from home. But as the business grows, they may have to consider bigger premises. So please note that starting from home means that your overhead cost must, might be lower. But as the business grows and they move out to bigger premises, that will also increase other expenses. So please be aware of things like that. Available raw materials. Right, so... The raw materials that must be used or ingredients must be easily obtainable. And then um, the advice is to make use of local material. So why? Why is that advice made? Right? Because it's going to be cheaper, so it's going to save the business costs. And then also it might be easily available because it's locally available. Don't have to still wait for it to be imported. You are also supporting the local economy when you make use of local materials. And then, of course, um, when we think of the environment, you also have a smaller carbon footprint because it did not have to come from another country, it had to be transported. Um, and so that is how you can also then reduce your carbon footprint. So whenever we look at things like that, that is the background stuff that we need to be aware of also, the why. And then, of course, you want to build a good relationship with the suppliers as well so that you are also insured to get your raw materials, 
and get it on time. Right? And then the fifth one here is consumer attraction. Okay? So remember that your product will be on the shelves in competition with other products. And so you want to get the um, consumer's attention. So you want to appeal to customers by appealing to their five senses. Okay? Sight, touch, taste, etc. Okay, so these are the five factors and you need to know the factors that we need to consider when making when choosing a, um, a product or a service. So there are five. When you're studying, know the five. Okay, know the five so that you are able to apply when it's asked in the paper. The next thing that we're looking at here is factors influencing the efficient production of quality products. Okay, so remember the first one, the previous one were factors that we consider in the choice of the products or the service. Now the factors influencing the efficient production. So that's why I, what I want to bring under your attention. Look at the headings, look at what it is, what factors are we looking at when we're looking at the various factors so that you are sure when the question is being asked in the paper that you are giving the proper answer. Okay, so now we're looking at the factors influencing the efficient production. These can sometimes be a bit confusing and that's why I'm making you aware of it. Okay, so the first one there is planning. Okay, so when we're producing and we want to produce quality products, Planning must be done so carefully, so the company, the entrepreneur, the business must be aware of the following three things, their production goals, they must set targets, production planning, okay, it's important to plan, um, set a schedule, um, determining the order of work, right, why do you want to do that, why are these things important, right, so that you know um, how many things you can produce, um, so that you know if you've got an order of 500 versus 5,000, how long it's going to take. And then, of course, also planning production costs. Costs are used to determine the selling price. So in terms of planning, but in terms of producing quality products, you want to do proper planning, and those um, aspects must be considered. Number two, you want to adhere to product specifications, right? And why do you want to do that? Why do we want to stick to the product specifications that we've set? Because we want to ensure the product is always the same, right? In terms of its appearance, texture, and weight, this will help to standardize the product. It would help to, uh, for the workers to know what the quality is that's expected. It will help customers also to know what to expect. So that is why it's important to adhere to product specifications. Number three is quality control. This is the process of inspecting products to make sure it meets the required standards, right? So quality control is important and quality control must be built into every stage of production, right? So from the start to the end and here are the stages of production that quality control must be built into. So the quality of raw materials that's used when it's ordered, when it comes, when it's delivered, it must be checked. Throughout the production process, the different stages of the production pro process, right? Um, it must be checked that the products that's being produced are adhering to the product specifications. Then once the product has have been completed, right? Then um, um, a checking system must be in, in place or a quality control system must be in place. And then also after it's been packaged. Okay, so these are all ways in which the business want to control right, to make sure that they are producing a quality product. The fourth one is to have a tidy workplace. And so why is this important? It's important for the following reasons, right, to ensure the safety of the worker because this will prevent accidents and fire, fires to be organized, make it easy to find things, okay, if your workplace is tidy and everybody knows where everything is, it's organized, so it makes it easier, so it's going to save time as well, right? Then, of course, it also reduces stress, because you're not stressing about where's everything, and it improves efficiency, 
okay? Because you are more organized, you're saving time, you're doing things at a faster pace, okay? And then it also, of course, minimize the risk of cross-contamination, especially where food is being produced, right? So that's why a tidy workplace is important in order to ensure quality product are produced. Number five is the hygiene of workers, right? Um, and so why is this important, right? People work with other people, so um, if they have bad odor or um, breath, it can affect colleagues. If they are working with customers, that is even more important, okay? Um, and more so when they are working with food, hygiene is extremely important um, because we want to avoid um, cross-contamination or contamination of the food. Number six is careful control of finances. And so here we see that um, it's important that the entrepreneur or the business have sound record keeping of money. This is important because ultimately um, if, if, if that is a problem, that can be one of the causes why the business fail. And so the first thing there is that they need to consider the budget Right, so we've looked at budgets in grade 11, indicates income and expenditure of money. They want to have a look at stock management. Okay, and so now why is it important, right, that we have a look at stock management when it comes to producing quality products? It's for these reasons. If, if the business have too little stock, this can result in less income because there might be cancelled orders, there might be unhappy customers. If the business, has, if they've got too much stock, this can result in money tied up in stock, okay? And so they might not have a good cash flow. They might have cash flow problems. Um, the business might also have a lack of storage if they've got too many stock, right? Or it might cause the damage of the stock if it, the, the stock re um, reaches um, expiry dates or if it's not stored properly and it breaks, etc. Okay, so that is why stock management is important okay managing the stock properly so that we ensure quality products and then of course cost accounting these are all methods to control the finances so why is cost accounting important right we need to keep track of all cost and this includes the break-even point business must be very aware of when break-even point is reached another term that you need to know right and then also um what are the fixed costs and what are the variable costs and what is the profit margin for the business okay so these are the things that's going to help them manage cost accounting better and so those are the things that they need to know okay so these are all things background things that you need to be aware of of why is it important that we have careful control of finances and then we've got Stock control refers to um, raw material, so controlling the stock, right? Um, yes, yeah, specifically. So the raw materials that's in stock, it includes the work that's in progress and as well as the finished pro products. Okay, so this is, so all of those, the business must be aware of because they've got money tied up in that. Right, so it's also to ensure that enough ingredients or materials are available for production. Okay, so it is important for the following reasons, right? Why is stock control important? Okay, so these are also things that you need to know, right? All things that ties to producing efficient quality products. It is important for the following reasons. You do not want um, production to stop because you have a shortage of raw materials or ingredients okay so that is why stock control business must have stock on hand when they've got a certain amount of orders you do not want wastage of materials right so when you have um, don't have proper stock control don't have storage right it might be wasted you want to um, help to prevent theft and so that is why proper stock control systems must be in place you also want to prevent overstocking, which might lead to wastage or spoilage once again. And then, of course, you want to ensure the right quality of ingredients are purchased for products. And as we've said um, previously already, 
you do not want to have too much stock because you have will have money being tied up in stock and that might um, result into cash flow products a uh, cash flow problem sorry right so grade 12 these are you'll see the previous one the factors that we have to consider in the choice those were five the factors for efficient production of quality products these are seven so you need to work out a system so as to remember um, the differences between them okay so that when it's asked in a question you are able to answer okay so um, the only way in which you can do that is by studying properly today i'm going to have a look at the requirements for the efficient production which is part of unit three and then i'm also continuing with unit four developing a marketing product and then unit five sustainable profitability of an enterprise grade 12 what you will know today is that i have made a summary so what i've tried to do is to summarize and and these were quite a lot of slides that i've tried to summarize into even less slides just to get everything on one slide just to have all of 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 unit one uh, of the unit sorry uh, tried to get it together so what i just actually want to mention here is that these are summaries so please when you when i when i look at a unit okay as we're going through it here this is just to help you um with the studying and help you with remembering better also please have a look at the information in the textbook so let's get going so i'm going to get started first of all here as i said continue with unit three the efficient production of quality products so we've already looked at the factors that influence production of quality products so today we are going to have a look at the requirements for quality products okay so let's start and you will see there are quite a quite a few requirements and i've tried to fit it all onto this slide right so the first one is the quality of raw ingredients when we want a quality end product the input must also be a good quality okay and so i've match that one to the quality of storage because if we don't store our raw ingredients properly it might influence the quality of it and remember here we can refer to ingredients but we can also talk about raw materials so why is quality of storage important? Quality of storage is important, as I've already said, because you want your raw materials, raw ingredients to be of a good quality by the time when you need it. And so that is why efficient storage procedures should be in place. And these are things that you want to keep in mind. You want to have sufficient storage, enough storage to store all of your raw materials successfully. You want to have frequently used stock easily obtainable, easily reachable. There should be procedures for checking in and checking out in place. This is so that you can know what you've got, what you need to order in, what has been used. Okay, so that is why it's important. And latching on to the previous point, you need to have regular checks, right, just to make sure that stock is not being damaged. That it is still at the correct, uh, stored at the correct temperature or humidity, whatever the requirements are, or that it's not stolen, okay, or that there's enough and how much you must order in. So those things must all be in place, right? And then where it's applicable, you need to use correct temperatures. Storage space should be clean um, and free of mildew and damp or dirt, all things that can um, reduce the quality. Of your raw materials and then a good point to make use of is make use of the first in first out principle and this is basically because when we look at certain raw materials they might have a use by date okay and so you want to make sure that that which been bought last are going to be used last and that which has been bought first are going to be used first according to its due dates when we have a look at the next concept here this is sustainable production and consumption 
This is a concept that can stand on its own, but I've also brought it in here because when we are producing products, we want to make use of sustainability. And the reason here is that we want to have a smaller carbon footprint. We want to have a low impact on the environment. So sustainable production and consumption is important also. And here um, we want to have a look at both the consumer and the producer. Okay, so grade 12, there are additional information that you need to have a look at um, and in connection with ways in which consumers and producers can reduce their carbon footprint by making use of reducing, reusing and recycling. Okay, so please also have a look at that. So we can bring this in also over here. Then safety is also important. Um, so when we have a look at production, at every section of production, um, we make we need to have um, safety in place, right? Um, whether it's producing um, food or producing any other product, where we have to consider not just the safety of the workers, maybe also the safety of the potential customers that's going to use it. Okay, so if you want to have a quality product, you need to make sure of that. And latching onto this and something that we can bring in here is the maintenance of equipment. If you want to have a quality end product, you need to have equipment that works properly. Okay, if the equipment is not going to be working properly, okay, it might um, have an influence on your products. Okay, and so what are the things that we want to be aware of in terms of maintenance of equipment? It must work effectively. Okay, if it doesn't work, if it doesn't cut as it should cut, if it doesn't Mix as it should mix, it means that it's going to affect the end product, the quality of the end product. When we have a look at maintenance of equipment here, you will see that we talk about preventative maintenance, and this is where it's the equipment is regularly checked to prevent breakages. Okay, and so when we do this, it means that we're not going to have equipment just breaking down, and um, then we have stoppage in production. Or we can have a look, the other way that sometimes that people make use of is corrective maintenance. And this is only done once the equipment is broken. And this is not a good way to go about because this can stop production. Unless people have additional equipment, of course, to use. Right? But keep that in mind because that will also um, interfere. If the equipment is not working properly, will interfere with the quality of the products. Okay, so the next requirement I'm looking at here is when products are made, it's made with a target group in mind. Okay, so we want to stick to product specifications so that it stays appropriate for the target group, right? Um, and then also customer relations. What are the customers saying? What, how are they experiencing the product? It's important to know. It's important to deal with customers. Complain swiftly when there are complaints because that is going to tell you something. They might have a problem with the, the quality of the product. So that is what something that you want to know. Um, and so that is why it's important to get regular feedback from your customers. Okay. So what you will see here is that I've tried to group, when it comes to quality in products here, I've tried to group here, I've looked at the people. Okay, and so staff training is also important um, when we, we look at um, producing quality products. You want to make sure that your staff is trained well, okay, so that they can um, give out or, or help to produce quality products. And these are the reasons why that is important, right? If they are trained well, it will improve the quality of the work. It will increase productivity. It will reduce wastage. Okay, so less wastage. It will improve the employee's morale or their confidence. And then also it will help to reduce maintenance and repair costs because they know how to use the equipment, machinery, etc. And so um, 
with them knowing they will know how to work it properly. Um, so not breaking equipment, etc. Okay, so that is why staff training is important also. The staff is trained, if they know what to do, they will be able to give a good product. Part of having a good end product is also how we present it. So presentation of the product is important. And going hand in hand with this is things like labeling, okay? Giving information when we put our labels on. Um, there are certain things here also that we need to consider. Um, and we're going to have a look at that. Going hand in hand with that is the quality and design um, of our packaging. Okay, and so that's all got to do with the presentation of the product and how the, the potential customer is going to look at it. You want it to look good because you want people to choose your product above the competition. Okay, and so we've already looked at the, um, how you can make use of packaging to be a private, uh, or to be a um, yeah, private salesman. Okay, so remember that. When we are going to be distributing the products, we need to store it and deliver it. So this is also a concept that can stand separate, but this also is going to ensure that the product, once it gets to the customers, okay, that is still in a good condition. So that is why storage and delivery strategies are important. Okay, so let's have a look at why it's important. If it's going to be food stuff that's going to be have have to be delivered, it needs to be protected against um, a contamination, of course. So proper packaging and storage deliveries, um, storage and delivery strategies must be applied. So we need to think of perishable foods that must be transported in cool boxes or refrigerated trucks. And then while it's being transported, no damage should occur. And then, of course, we want to keep the delivery times short, especially if it's foods that need to be transported, warm foods or cool foods. And then, of course, you want to stick to delivery dates and times so that you do not have uh, problems with your um, customers. The last one I want to have a look at here for requirements for quality in products is efficient use of time. And so we see that um, it's important to plan in advance. So in order for us to have to achieve all of these requirements, efficient planning is important. Efficient use of time, right? It is um, important that we plan so that equipment is used to full capacity. It is important that we um, plan properly so that the, if, uh, the workers can be doing their work efficiently to produce the maximum amount of products, especially if there are orders that must be completed within a time. So that efficient use of time is then also important. Okay, so these are all the requirements so that we can be ensured of the efficient production for quality in products, okay? Right, we are going to move to the next unit, which is developing a marketing plan. When we look at developing a marketing plan, We will see that we're going to deal with a 5P marketing strategy or mix. When we look at marketing, we see that the, the marketing function is normally the link between production and the consumer. So the marketing department must have work hand in hand with all of the other functions in a business. The 5P marketing strategy or mix consists of the activities that are developed to satisfy consumer needs. So you will see that it normally comes back to the target market and their needs. So when marketing is applied, when we are looking at the five Ps, we are constantly thinking of the target market. Okay, so the first P, so first of all, let's just quickly 
remind ourselves the five P's are product, price, place, promotion, and people. Okay? These cannot be seen independently of each other. They all work hand in hand. So we're going to have a look at that and all of the important things that we need to keep in mind. So we're starting with the first P, which is product. Um, and so we talk about product, but it can be also be the service over here. Um, so these are the things that we want to keep in mind about um, the product. Okay, when we mark um, developing the marketing strategy, you want your product to have a competitive edge. By now, you know what this term means. And then we've looked at quality production, efficient production, so that we have quality. So we want to have um, a good quality product, and it must obviously be suitable for the target market. You want to have appropriate labels and packaging. And then you want to adhere to the product specification. Okay, you need to have established your product specification and you want to adhere to it. And then, as I said previously, also when it's um, the product is being produced or when the product is being decided upon, it should be a product that is suitable for your target market. And so these are the, uh, the following things that we need to keep in mind also and need to know, right, about the product, the brand name. So this is a spoken name of the product and it can include a slogan, right? And so when we talk about the spoken name is the name that we're going to recognize, right, as consumers, things like Sunlight, Ariel, Omo, etc. And then the next thing is the brand mark or the trademark. So these are all things that you want to have in place. For your product, a brand mark or a trademark is a symbol or a crest that's associated with a product or service, which then allows easy identification. Okay? This has got to do with the image um, or the perception that the consumers have of the products. And so when I bring up these um, brand marks over here, I don't even have to tell you what is the one selling or what is the other selling? If I say KFC and you look at it, you'll immediately know, know it's they're selling chicken. If you see that big M there, you know it's McDonald's. Okay, so this is then um, e um, easily identification identifiable. Um, and you will see the brand image includes the product appeal and um, ease of use and, and, and just the fact that people can um, recognize it easily. Then we go on to the trade name. So please know the difference between these three. This is the brand name or mark that has been registered under the Trademarks Act. Okay. And so what does that mean? It basically means that the manufacturer gets legal protection by prohibiting the use of the name by competitors for 10 years. So that is the name that they will be trading in. Sometimes we see that business have got a trade name, so that's the name they're trading in, but they've got a brand name, okay, so that is the name that is recognized by the customers, so please know the difference there. The next thing with your, with, with, with the product is labeling, okay, so labeling is important because this gives information, right, on your labels, you normally have information about your product. And we can make use of labels to market a product. Okay, so we can have information on there to market a product or um, other products that you've got um, available. Labeling forms part of the packaging. Okay, or it can be attached to the article. And then, of course, the other part that's important for your product is packaging. Okay, so what are the important things that we want to remember about packaging? Okay, when we look at the packaging, we see that um, it is important that it protects the product from damage. Okay, it can also be used as a silent salesman, right? So we want to, where nobody is there to promote it, when people have a look at it, they're going to want to buy it. That is basically what it means when it's a silent salesman or the information on it um, speaks to the target market. So how can it be a silent salesman? It can be designed to catch the eye and attract attention. So you must remember that your product might be um, competing with other products. So that's why it should stand out from other products. 
it should be suitable for the type of product and target market. And then, of course, you want it to be well designed. It must obviously be suitable, suited for the type of product. So um, it must be well designed for easy handling, convenient handling, so that people don't struggle, because that might be a deciding factor. If people are struggling to open it or use it, or it's not protecting the, the contents properly, people might not consider to buy a, another product. And then, of course, depending on the type of content, right, it must be airtight or waterproof. Okay, especially if it's likely to absorb moisture, for example, sugar. Okay, so that is product. And these are all of the important things that you want to remember with this first P. The next one is place. So when we look at place, we are talking about where, where is your product going to be produced, the so place of production, um, and then place of distribution and storage, and where is the point of sale going to be. Okay, so that is the second P here, place. So when we look at distribution, Right, there are two distribution options that the, the entrepreneur can use. They can either opt for direct selling, sell their own products, or indirect selling where they make use of a middleman. Let's first of all have a look at direct selling and why a business or an entrepreneur would want to consider, consider direct selling. Um, it might be that they want to demonstrate their own product. They want to... Um, have that opportunity and then it might be that they want to control the following they want to be in control over fixing their price okay so they don't want a middleman that's going to be adding and then they don't have control over the price they also might have to want to have control over how workers are motivated to increase sales because um, the salespeople are going to be, um, they're not going to have a middleman, so they're going to have their own salespeople. They want to have strict control over their brand name and image. And of course, they want to ensure the best marketing for the product or serving. So these can be reasons why a business opt to make use of direct selling instead of indirect selling. Okay, so um, with indirect selling, we know the use of a middleman can refer to um, supermarkets or um, cafes or whoever is um, selling the product on behalf of the manufacturer. Okay, so with indirect selling, we said it's making use of a middleman. The retailer acts as a link between the producer and consumer. Okay, um, with indirect selling, sales can be increased for the company when selling to the wholesaler. Why? Because the wholesaler normally buy in larger quantities. And then what we also should remember about indirect selling, once it is sold to the wholesaler, um, they become responsible for risks and damages. Or once it is sold to the middleman, right, they become responsible for risks and damages or damages. Okay. So that is place. Let's continue to the next P. People. So, the groups of people that's being considered, and it's important, is obviously, first of all, the target market, right? When the marketing team plans this strategy, they must keep the target market in mind. The marketing team, they are important because they are responsibility for de responsible for developing a marketing plan. The salespeople, right, because they must make sure that sales are made then of course we can also refer to those helping to spread the word and the employees as well okay so these are the groups of people that is going to be considered and as i said the most important group of people for the entrepreneur for the company for the business is the target market and this refers to the people who want to purchase your product or service they are um and they are willing to pay the price that you are charging. Or we say it refers to the people who have a need for your product and 
are willing to pay the price that you are charging. Right? And so it's important for the marketing team to determine exactly who the target market is for the product or the service. And so here, market segmentation comes into play. We spoke about market segmentation in, um, if you can remember, in grade 10 already. This is where the market, the target market, is um, divided into smaller groups, right? More specific groups. And then the marketing campaigns must focus on the needs of the target market. Okay, so um, it's important that the marketing team take note of the needs of the target market. And then with regards to employing people, suitable people must be employed. And then we've looked at why it's important um, for people to be trained properly. Um, and then those involved in marketing should know and understand the product. If you are marketing, if you are going to be promoting, you need to have a good understanding of the product. And then, of course, you need to have good communication skills to enable you to do that. The next P is promotion. So when we look at promotion, this is the method that is used to communicate the product or the service. Right? And so here we can make use of advertising, which we're going to have a look at briefly because we've covered that in grade 10 as well. And then sales promotions that can be used to encourage sales. And then um, sometimes companies, as we've said, make, uh, might um, want to make use of personal selling or direct sales. So with promotion, with this P, business can make use of advertising or publicity to promote their, biz their business. So let's just quickly have a look at publicity. This is news that is shared in the mass media about a business. Publicity um, can be done where an article is being written about the product. But what you need to remember about publicity, if it's, it's free. Publicity is normally free. The business doesn't pay for it. But the business does not have control over the content. Okay, because it might be a journalist that's writing an article over it that they've researched or a TV program that, um, that is talking about the product or the service. So be aware of, uh, of that publicity. And then, of course, the other method to communicate the product or service that is used extensively in business is advertising. And advertising is basically um, making use of this method to provide information and used to persuade people to buy, to purchase the product or the service. And so when we are looking at advertising, remember that um, we want to make use of the ADA principle um, in order for us to have good advertising. So good advertising, make use of the ADA principle. Also still remember it from grade 10, the acronym ADA um, until the following, the A, you want to attract attention. So when an advertisement is being made, you want to make use of color, photos, special offers or fee samples, or maybe even make use of a celebrity just to get the attention of the potential customers or the market or, or the target group. So you want to create interest in their product. Okay, so now you want people to get interested um, in the product, so you might be offering something. You want to create a desire in cl clients to buy it immediately, right? You might say stuff like first 100 customers or um, it's going to make you feel better or people are going to think that it's going to relieve their pain or whatever the case may be so that people have a desire to want to buy it. Um, and then, of course, the advertisement wants to motivate clients to take action by buying the product. They want the, to, to the, the, the people to go over into action, okay, to actually go and purchase. So they might use statements um, or two for the price of one, something to get people to, to go, okay.
only 500 left or whatever the case may be over there. So you need to know um, how we can develop good advertising by making use of the ADA principle. And then advertising can make use of types of media. And so here you will see the types of media. It's print media, electronic media, and outdoor media, as well as direct mail. Okay. And so these categories, under these categories, we've got different types. So you need to know the categories and the um, examples as is given here. Print media there. They can make news, uh, use of the newspaper, magazines, catalogs, pamphlets, labels, packaging, anything that's printed. Electronic media. TV, radio, internet, cell phone, social media, Facebook, Twitter, etc. Outdoor media, billboards, advertising on vehicles, public toilet doors, etc. And then direct mail when it's sent via post, slow mail there. So that is promotion. Let's have a look at the last P. And the last P here is price. And one of the things that the when the business the entrepreneur sets their price is to consider the target market. Okay, because ultimately those are the people that's going to be supporting the business. So when they set their price, they must keep in mind that the selling price must include produ production costs plus profit, because selling price equal costs plus profit. Besides the fact that you want to consider the target market, you also want to consider what the competition is charging. Okay, because sometimes if you come in too low, um, people might be thinking that it's you, you might not have a good quality, or you might not make good profit if you come in too low. If you come in too high, people might not buy because it's too expensive. So you want to be on par with what the competition is charging. And then sometimes discounts are used um, to, to encourage purchases. Things like bulk discount or seasonal discount or cash discount, right? So discount is sometimes offered to encourage people to purchase. When price is being set, okay, or with the price, remember, ultimately when people are purchasing products, um, this is going to be the income for the business. So there are specific goals that business sometimes keep in mind. When they set their price, the first one is obviously to make profit. So they're going to set their selling price to cover all costs and then make a profit as well. Okay, so that um, is the ultimate goal. Um, the next one might be market share. Prices are kept low to increase sale, sales and develop brand loyalty because they want a share of a market. They want to get into the market. They want more people to purchase their product. Increase in sales. Here, the goal is to increase the number of sales. And then, of course, business wants to survive. So survival is a specific goal also. And the goal would be to keep the business operational, especially when there's intense competition or when the consumer need, needs changes. Let's have a look at the pricing strategies that business apply okay and so here we're going to have a look at three pricing strategies that they can apply to set their prices so the first one is cost-based pricing so here the the selling price is set to cover all costs and adding a profit markup different products can have different markups okay so cost-based is first um covering all costs and then adding a profit Demand-based pricing. Here, the selling price will be determined by, by what the target market is willing to pay. So they will aim to keep the production cost low to ensure profit. Okay, so determined by what the target market is willing to pay. Demand-based pricing. And then lastly here, um, competition-based pricing. Um, the strategy that will be used whereby... The price is going to be considered by what the competition is charging. Okay, so those are the pricing strategies and that is um, the final P. 
Right, we are now going to go into sustainable profitability of an enterprise. When people go into business, the aim is to make money. Okay, the aim is to make, to continually make a profit. So that is what sustainable profitability is about. Is over time to make enough money to cover the expenses, but also make a profit. So sustainable profitability is the ability of a business to maintain or increase profit at a steady level, this is over a long time, without exhausting or misusing human and material resources. Okay, so we're looking at making profit over time. So when we look at a business that wants to sustain their profits, what are the characteristics going to be? So characteristics of a business that wants to achieve sustainable profitability are the following things that we're going to have a look at. The first one is that the business must have a plan in place to ensure growth and sustain profit. Okay, so that's why they're going to put goals into place so that they, um, and strategies into place so that they achieve their goals right and so that they increase sales business needs to work smartly okay so you don't want to work hard you want to work smart is what they normally say um so they need to have a look at new technology new machine machinery new things that's being developed um and to work smartly it's important that they also plan properly okay so these are all things that they um want to keep in mind it's also important if they want to have sustained profitability is to remain in touch with their customers and their needs right remember the target market ultimately supports the business so it's important to stay in, in touch get feedback know what they're thinking about the product know about their changing needs so that the, the product can also be adapted accordingly Keep up with the current trends and changes in trends, right? So remember, as fashion changes, it also influences other things, okay? Food, um, trends changes, clothing trends changes. So business wants to be aware of the train, changing trends so that they can also then um, adapt accordingly. And then put strategies in place to adapt to challenges and changes in the environment. Right? When there's things happening, changes in the environment, how is the business going to ensure that they survive? How are they going to adapt to those changes and challenges to survive? So these are all characteristics that a business wants to have to make sure that they achieve sustainable profitability. Okay, we're going to have a look at a feasibility study. When you start out a business, or maybe you are um, looking at something new to do in the business, it's important to do what is known as a feasibility study because you want to determine whether the new idea or the new business is going to be successful. Okay, so a feasibility study is an analysis and an evaluation of a proposed project or idea to determine if it will succeed. So when you have a look at um, doing a feasibility study, you want to check to see whether the idea is going to succeed. And a feasibility study, as I've said before, is normally done before starting a new business or spending more money on a new business idea or project. So what, let's quickly just have a look at the purpose of a feasibility study. Why is it important to do a feasibility study? For the following reasons, right? It will help the business to discover the strengths and the weaknesses, right? It's important that the business is aware of the weaknesses so that they know how to improve, right? As well as their strengths so that they know how to make use of that, right? So a feasibility study will help with that. It also gives a picture of whether a particular business has the potential for success. It shows how the business idea could be changed or adapted. So when you look at it, 
you can look at it and see what can we do to improve. When we look at a feasibility study, you will see that the focus is normally on um, the financial part. Okay, so financial feasibility is the focus normally in a feasibility study, right? And it focuses on the following. It's used to calculate how startup capital, um, how much startup capital is needed, where the capital can be obtained, the type of return on investment, in other words, profit that, um, that you can make, that could be expected. Also, to calculate the cost price of a selling product and to determine the selling price, which we are going to have a look at as well. Okay, so these are things that you need to know. What is sustainable profitability? What is, feasible, what is a feasibility study? Okay, All right, let's continue. So when we look at a feasibility study, remember I said the financial part in the fi um, feasibility study is what we'll be focused on. So next we're going to have a look at the costs that need to be calculated in order to draw up a feasibility study, or as we refer to it also as doing costing. So when we look at doing a costing, all the costs that needed, it's important that we know the terms. Remember, grade 12, terms are important. It's important that you know your terms and understand them, know their definitions. Okay, so first of all, let's have a look. Start Startup costs, also known as pre-operation costs, or your capital. So it includes things like equipment costs. So when you have to purchase equipment to start the business, registration costs. And initially, um, total production costs, because um, initially you're also going to need operational costs to keep the business operational, right, until the sales cover the expenses and costs. So those are different things that can, can for, form part of the capital or the pre-operational costs. All right, then we've got production costs. These are expenses that a business must pay in order to supply goods and services to its customers. In other words, the cost that they're going to incur when they are producing their products. There are two types of production costs. We talk about fixed costs, costs that remain the same regardless of how many products are made. Right? Costs, expenses like rent, insurance, vehicle repayments, etc. And then we get variable costs. These are all the expenses that are directly invo involved in the making of a product and likely to change, for example, material cost or ingredients cost, packaging, labor. So please note the difference between those two, your fixed costs and your variable costs. And so to make it a bit easier to understand, I'm going to have a look at this graph over here. Okay. So at this um, point in time, I am going to just get a pointer. Not there yet. So here you will see, okay, I just quickly want to make the difference in fixed costs and variable costs and how it influences expenses. Here we've got the number of units produced. 2,000, 4,000, 6,000, 8,000. 10,000, etc. As you can see, that's the number of units that's produced on this graph. And over here is the cost, okay, to produce it. So you'll see there 20,000, 40,000, 60,000, 80,000, 100,000, and etc. Okay, so please just have a look at the labels there. And so what I want you to note is in red here, whether you are producing 2,000, 4,000, up until 18,000 product, you will see that the fixed cost remains the same. So you will see, right, the company's fixed cost is 100,000 Rand. Okay, so whether we're producing 2,000, no matter how many products we produce, fixed cost remains the same. So that will include things that we refer to here, rent, insurance, vehicle payments, etc., salaries. Okay, so that is what the company will give out, whether they're making or not making, or no matter how many products they are making. Then what I want you to note in orange here, okay, and this is the total cost. So this total cost will include the fixed cost, 
plus the variable cost. So as the company makes more products, you will see the variable cost will increase. Okay, so the so the fixed cost will obviously be the variable cost will be added to the fixed cost, and so this will increase the total cost. So the more products we're making, the more material we're using, or the more ingredients we're using, the more packaging we're using to make more products is going to increase the variable cost, and with that, the total cost, as you can see over here. Okay, so when the company makes more products, the variable cost will increase. That is what I want you to note. And hopefully that is going to make you understand the difference there between um, fixed cost and variable cost. I'm going to come back to this graph, but let's continue. Um, part of your cost is your overheads. This is the additional cost that must be paid in order for a business to operate and these uh, might not be directly involved in production like for example electricity water stationary fuel salaries phone right so not directly involved in the production but still needed to keep the company going then um, when we determine uh, when we do costing the main thing that we want to get to is to determine the selling price so this is about what the business will charge for the final product or service. Okay. And so a cost-based strategy, strategy can be used to determine selling price. And this is where, we remember, we've looked at those other three um, strategies, demand-based, competition-based, um, or cost-based. So um, with cost-based, the selling price is equal to the cost price plus the markup, okay, which we'll have a look at just now. So what is the markup? This is the percentage or amount that's added to the cost price. So once you've done um, the total cost price, total production cost price, you want to then add a markup. The markup must cover all overhead expenses as well as the profit. Okay, so we need to know all of this. And then just before I'm going to go into the actual costing, there are some other things that we need to understand in business also, and that is referred to as the best, um, best and worst sale scenario. So best sale occurs if a business meets um, its sales target and achieves its sales objectives. A worst sale scenario refers to um, if a business sold less than its break-even point resulting in a loss. And just before I'm going back to the graph, I also just want to bring in this. The break-even point, this is a point at which the total revenue and total costs are equal. So there will be no loss or gain for the business at this point. So let's have a look at, you will see um, on this graph, right, you will see the break-even point over here. So when this company makes, 10, makes and sell 10,000 products, right, the expenses will be 120,000 Rand, right? When they sell the 10,000 products, they will make the 120,000 Rand. That will then be known as the break even point. So, to break even for this company, they must sell 10,000 products. Okay. So, what then will be if we have a look at this graph, be a worse sell scenario? If they sell less than 10,000 products will be a worse sale scenario because it means that they didn't even sell enough products, right, to cover all costs. If they sell more than their break-even point and they reach the targets that they've set, then we say that is a best sale scenario. Okay, so a graph like this will help us to understand these concepts. Let's continue. And so here I want to have a look at determining the selling price. All right. When we determine the selling price, we first of all need to calculate production costs. So here we will calculate the cost of raw materials or ingredients, which includes packaging. We also will include the labor costs. Um, and, and so the example that I'm giving here 
is maybe they say the worker has been paid 70 rand per hour. And then, of course, um, when the selling price is determined, a markup should be added. And as we've said previously, this is the percentage or amount added to the cost price, and it must cover all overhead expenses as well as the profit percentage that we want to include. So let's quickly have a look at this example. When you are going to be required to determine, cost, to determine the costing, please have a look at all of the information that will be given to you. So the example of cost for 100 products, so already I'm telling you it's, this example is for 100 products. So the cost of ingredients and packaging, this is for 100 products, is 550. Okay, so the costing, the cost there is 550. The labor cost for this one worker is 30 Rand for 8 hours. So now we know the workers working for 8 hours and they're being paid 30 Rand. So we multiply here and we see that they are going to be paid 240 Rand. So that is going to be part of the production cost. So the total production cost there is 790 Rand when we add up those two. And now the markup that we want to um, add here, which will include overhead expenses as well as the profit percentage, is 100%. And so we will determine what 100% of the 790 Rand is. It's exactly 790 Rand. So we add that back to the production cost and we see that the total selling price is 1,580 Rand. Now... It says selling price per unit. So here we see we want to determine now what the selling price is going to be if we are going to sell it per unit. And so we know already that this costing was done for 100 products. So if it's 1,580, the total selling price, we need to divide by 100. And that is going to give us 15 Rand and 80 cents. And so when we round that off to the nearest rand, because it is above, the 80 cents is above 50 there, we're going to round it off to 16 rand. Okay, so this is the example. So now I want to have a look at how it can be asked in a paper and what you need to be on the lookout for. Right, so here we've got a little bit of a scenario. It says Mandla has received an order for 120 mini cakes that will be used as wedding gifts for the guests. So this comes from a question where there might have been a case study. And so the question then says, use the information below to calculate the selling price of one mini cake. Round off, to this, round off the selling price to the nearest rand show all calculations. Great trials, when you get something like this, you want to be noting the following. You see I would have highlighted, right? The order was for 120 mini cakes. And what does he have to do? Right? You need to determine the selling price of one mini cake. So if they want you to determine a unit um, price there, it needs to be rounded off. So all of these things are things that you need to keep in mind. You need to show all your calculations. That is seven marks. Okay, these are seven marks that you want to make sure that you are going to get. So let's quickly have a look at the information that was given. The cost of ingredients for 20 mini cakes. Now look at this information because this can be confusing, right? The order was for 120, but now they say the cost was for 20 mini cakes. So that already tells you that if 20 mini cakes is 360 what will 120 what will the cost of ingredients be for 120 mini cakes and then the next information says cost of packaging is for 120 mini cakes is 220 rand so that is straightforward and then cost of electricity is 70 rand that is straightforward and then they tell you that Mandla wants to make a 70% profit. So when information like this is given, all of this information will have to be used when you do the costing calculation. So let's see what it is that you need to do in this example. 
Remember, the only way in which you are going to improve is by trying to do examples from past papers. So let's first have a look at determining production costs. So first of all, we know, right, that he pays 360 for 20, but he's making 120. So we want to determine, right, um, if 20 mini cakes is 360, what will 120 do? What will 120 cost? So we're looking at doing a division here, okay, to determine what we are going to multiply the cost of ingredients with. So 120 divided by 20 equals 6, right? So we now know, right, 20 mini cakes is 360, right? We've determined um, 120. We've seen that the total is 120, so we've divided by 20. So that we know what we need to multiply with the 360. So now we say 360 rand multiplied by 6. There you can see your first mark. Okay, plus we need to add 220 because that is for the cost of the packaging for the 120 mini cakes. And the 70 rand is the cost of electricity. Those all must then be added together. Okay, so the 360 times 6 is going to give us 2,000. 2160 plus the 220 plus the 70 rand which is going to give, give us 2450 rand for 120 mini cakes so to produce the 120 mini cakes cost 2450 rand please remember to put the rand unit while you are doing your calculations now that is what it costs to make it. So now we need to determine the selling price. And we know that he wants to add a profit of 70%. So that is what we need to add. Okay. So we can say 2,450 divided by 100 multiplied by 70 over, a, over 1. That is one way of going about. Or we can say 2,450 times 175%. Okay. And that is going to give us. When we do it, doing it the first way, right, um, we see that 1,715 is 70% of 2,450. So once we've determined that, we add the 1,715 rand to the, the 2,450. That is then going to give us. 4,165 Rand for 120 units. Okay, when we do it, when we do it this way, where we got 2,450 times 175%, it's going to give us this answer directly. Okay, so 4,165 Rand is what we are then going to, what's going to be the selling price. So when we sell the 120 units, that is going to be the selling price. But it does not stop there. That's why you need to read your questions properly because it says that um, selling price of one mini cake. So now we've determined it costs 120. We get The selling price will be 4,165 for 120 units. So now let's determine the selling price per unit. And so 4,165, we're going to divide by 120. Because that was the total amount of um, mini cakes. And that is going to be 34 Rand and 70 cents is going to be the selling price for one mini cake. But it does not stop there because the question also said round off the selling price to the nearest Rand. So for your next mark, you need to do round off. And so you see 3470. And that is going to be rounded off to 35 Rand for your last mark as well there. So I'm trying to give you an example to, to show you how you need to go about step by step and what you need to consider. So please remember my advice is try and go to past papers and work out. The only way in which you get um, better is by working out some of um, these examples in past papers. 
Okay, so grade 12, this is it for um, entrepreneurship, the two sections. No, I'm not done. I'm so sorry, I forgot this. Cash flow projection. <laughs> so let's go to cash flow, flow projection. That was for costing. Um, cash flow projection, also known as a, a forecast. So in other words, um, when we look at the forecast, it's a prediction. This is a document that shows the movement of money over a future period. So it predicts. Let's have a look at why cash flow projection is important. It will help with budgeting. It can be used as a monitoring, monitoring tool to see whether the business is achieving their financial goals. When we look at a cash flow projection, this is a project, projected amounts here. So it might not be accurate. The results might be different to the planned or to the actual. It will also help identify cash flow product cash flow problems that might creep up. It will ensure that the business has sufficient cash to pay supplies, employees, etc. So here is an example of a cash flow. And grade 12, it's important that you know how to read a cash flow projection. Okay, so this is an example. And so you will see, and what I want you to note over here, and I think I've lost my little pointer no there it is okay so you will see there's opening balance in january okay so i want you to see it says project projected cash flow statement so when a cash flow statement is drawn up it might be drawn up based on the previous year's um statement okay on the previous year's income and expenses so this statement is done for the first quarter of the year january february march april okay so this would have been done beforehand so that the company can see um forecast what is going to happen and then they can use it then to help identify as we say cash flow problems or make sure that they're going to have enough um money okay so this is projected as to what is going to happen or what they can expect so in January, the opening balance was 8,000 Rand. Then they've um, made sales of 10,000 Rand, a total there. So the income there was 10,000 for January. Then they had expenses, cash out, materials, marketing, wages, etc. So there you will see cash out, they paid out 9,000. So cash flow they've got is 1,000. Okay. So when we look at what they've had, they started um, with 8,000. Then they added 10,000 to income, which was 18,000. But then they had um, 9,000 that they've spent. So they are left with 1,000, right? So the, sorry, the cash flow is 1,000 and they are left with 9,000. Okay, so basically the opening balance and the income is added together and then they deduct the expenses to see what the cash flow is and then what they will end up with will be the closing balance. The closing balance of January will be the opening balance of February, as you can see over there. And now we look at what the company, the total sales for Feb is going to be projected what they will be spending, okay, what the cash flow amount will be, okay, right, which is the difference there between the cash in and the cash out, 2,500, and then we, as you can see, we either add, depending on whether we've, a cash flow is in a plus or a minus, add that to the opening balance, so then the closing balance will be 11,500. The closing balance of February will be the opening balance of March. As you can see there, 11,500 was our opening balance. We've made sales to the amount of 8,000 Rand. We've spent 9,000. 
right? So 9,000 minus 8,000 leaves us in a minus 1,000. That minus 1,000 we're going to deduct from the 11,500, which is going to leave us with 10,500. 10,500 closing balance of March is the opening balance of April. And then here, furthermore, we'll see that the company is making, expecting to make sales in um, to the value of 8,000 Rand. Spend 10,000, right? The difference between the income and the expenses there equals minus 2,000 which we are then going to deduct from the opening balance, which is going to leave the closing balance to the amount of 8,500. So it is important that you understand the, the cash flow statement so that if any questions are asked, that you are able to answer it, okay? Questions about um, the, um, when we have a look at, um, a good sales scenario, bad sales scenario, we should be able to read it from this type of information. Okay, so you need to understand how to read it. This is now the end for today, grade 12. Thank you for joining me today. I, I wish you all of the best for your um, exams. Okay. Um, yeah, thank you for joining me and study. And prepare well is all I can say right you need to put in the time right because what we put in is what we get out all of the best goodbye